Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Impact of Trauma and Addiction on Affect and Cognition. Uh, my name is Shay Kimbrough, and I am the Business Development Coordinator here at The Refuge. For those of you who don't know, The Refuge is a multi-level residential treatment facility for adults that specializes in substance abuse, trauma, and PTSD. Today, we are very honored to have Dr. Tom Antonek here uh, to participate in this webinar. Just to give you a little background on Dr. Antonek, he is a licensed psychologist who's been working in the mental health field since 1981. He's been with the refuge since 2011, and he has specialized in the assessment and treatment of individuals with substance use disorders, as well as those with comorbid psychiatric disorders, and especially PTSD. Uh, Dr. Antonek has conducted thousands of evaluations and countless hours of individual group and family therapy to adolescents and adult addicts and inpatient psychiatric hospitals, outpatient mental health clinics, university counseling centers, and in prison settings. He has spent the last 10 years working with impaired health providers in Florida, especially doctors and nurses, and he is also the president of Serenity Mission Incorporated, which is a 501c3 that is a community-based organization with a full range of substance abuse services in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, please welcome Dr. Tom Antonek. Greetings. Thank you very much. All right. Um, uh, just as a means of introduction, I, I appreciate all the uh, accolades about my experience. However, I'm also acutely aware that there are a number of people on the receiving end of this uh, presentation from prestigious uh, institutions around the country who uh, I'm sure uh, could, uh, you know, have the same degree of uh, professional experience in history. I, I guess if you do anything for 33 years, you, you develop a resume, right? So let's just jump in because we are, we're kind of time limited here. And uh, uh, the first slide you see is the impact of trauma and addiction on affect and cognition. It's kind of, again, given the population that's listening to this, it's it's rather an obvious, you know, statement. You know, if a person is victimized by being exposed to some uh, trauma, traumatic experience, they're going to, their resistance, their resilience and potential for adaptation to further stressors in their life is going to be diminished. In addition, um, if you have uh, symptoms consistent with a post-traumatic stress disorder, <clears throat> Generally speaking, individuals who suffer from this uh, disorder have uh, uh, an ongoing heightened state of arousal and a diminished ability to uh, modulate their emotional volatility. So uh, that's the emotional side of, of, uh, of PTSD uh, survivors. Uh, the cognitive side includes um, a lot of ruminations over the traumatic events, the, the, the replaying of the events, the, the intrusive uh, visual images in, in waking or, or sleep uh, states, uh, which impairs your cognitive efficiency. So in general, anyone who's on the uh, post side of being exposed to trauma is going to have a diminished cognitive capacity because of those potential ruminations and a diminished ability to maintain emotional stability. Okay, um, so that's what we're going to discuss today. Uh, let's take a look at quick defining uh, trauma by using the uh, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration's mm -hmm. definition. Okay? Um, the definition here, as you can see, includes not just an event or a series of events, but you know, it could be a set of circumstances where the individual is either physically or emotionally harmed or perceived as, as threatened because of the situation, okay? Uh, I like the way that they sum it up. In short, trauma is the sum of the event, the experience, and the effect. It's kind of like the old gestalt. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And uh, while we have a number of different uh, treatment providers uh, participating in this uh, CEU today, uh, representing a number of different uh, prestigious uh, institutions around the country, um, I suspect that while we all may be treating individuals who have tra trauma experiences, it doesn't mean that they're all homogenized, okay? Each individual brings, you know, their pre-traumatic experience level of functioning to the, to, to the setting the standard to the base level of their level of functioning before they're traumatized. So, you know, you have the event, the experience, and the effect of the event on the individual. Um, 
before we go on to the next slide, I just wanted to kind of digress for a minute and, and uh, talk about, we're going to define uh, addiction from an uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine perspective, but um, Judy mm -hmm. Crane, who is the founder of The Refuge, uh, has a nuts and bolts presentation where she talks about trauma, and uh, I like the way she defines trauma. She says trauma is visceral, okay? Uh, it's a sensory experience. It's, it's, it's impact, it impacts the individual right down to the cellular level. And uh, it's, it's more than just facts and figures. Uh, she makes the statement that trauma is a soul wound. And for me, I'm, that pretty much captures the essence of what I believe trauma is. It, it transcends articulation. We're going to talk about the affective experience, the cognitive experience, the actual effects of uh, trauma and how the person manifests that. As clinicians, we have to identify it, we have to measure it, we have to diagnose it. That's how we articulate it, that's how we communicate with each other. But at the end of the day, according to Judy, it's a soul wound. And uh, uh, Carl Jung was once quoted as saying, Learn your theories as well as you can, but lay them aside when you touch the miracle of the human soul. And, I, and, I, and in that sense, I think that what we're dealing with does transcend articulation or categorization or identification. However, we have to, we have to do that as professionals in order to communicate with one another. So trauma is a soul wound. She says it hurts and it wounds and it immobilizes people, and frequently the residual effects of being a trauma survivor is that you're frequently re-traumatized by the uh, situations that you uh, put yourself in, in terms or, or find the experiences of your life. You're, vulnerable, you're more vulnerable to further traumatization. She said that we develop coping skills uh, that become addiction, and this is the other component we're going to talk about. The addiction component isn't just um, what you smoke, snort, swallow, or shoot up. You know, uh, the uh, residual effects of being addict who self-medicating their trauma is that you can have some dissociation, some cutting, some binging, purging, anorexia, internet surfing, you can develop some of the more process-oriented addictions such as gambling or shopping, love and sex addiction, and obviously alcohol and chemical dependence are, another, are the ones that we're going to focus on today, but any other kind of compulsive behavior that is self-destructive and not a part of the solution is uh, the person who's a PTSD survivor is vulnerable to that. So let's take a look at the public policy statement by ASAM on a short definition of um, addiction, okay? Um, addiction is primary. It's, it's a, um, it's, it doesn't require any kind of uh, precipitating medical condition to be identified, okay, as a disease, okay? Uh, it can stand alone and doesn't need to be uh, secondary to any other pre-existing disease. It's a chronic disease of brain re reward, okay? So the chronicity speaks to not only is it primary, but it, it, it is over time. It's akin to, as you very well know, hypertension and diabetes, which are also chronic debilitating health conditions, okay? Um, it impacts your motivation. You know, addiction uh, uh, is a drive state that, that we need to satisfy with the substance that we are, our primary substance that we are addicted to. And then finally, it's a memory and related circuitry uh, condition. It impairs your judgment and it, it, it affects your cognitive function. Um, I was mindful of uh, another researcher that I looked into. Uh, Dr. Herman, back in 1997, talked about uh, trauma and recovery in the aftermath of violence from domestic abuse to political terror. And uh, not only does it does does addiction become a vehicle of trying to cope with tra trauma, but uh, you become overwhelmed with adaptations. Uh, and unfortunately, what she was saying is that traumatic events are extraordinary events, not because they're rare, but because of the severity of the event. And when, when individuals become incapacitated to cope with their trauma, and then engage in mind-altering substances as a vehicle to sustain their you know, ability to deal with the trauma, then the addiction itself also impairs judgment 
And it's kind of like going back to the Gestalt concept, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. From a Darwinian or survival perspective, uh, or evolution of the fittest, this is anyone who suffers from, a, from PTSD or traumatic events and then develops an addiction is incredibly vulnerable. It's like the antelope in the herd that has a broken leg. You know, it's, it's just um, not going to survive in the wild, even with the protection of the entire herd around him or her. Um, so the common denominator for trauma is uh, intense feelings of helplessness and uh, fear and uh, loss of control. Right? It, there's two aspects to the traumatic event, and, and I know that I'm, I'm into addiction already, but I just want to uh, lay more of a foundation for the addiction part, is that uh, trauma includes two components, a uh, psychological and behavioral component. Uh, psychologically speaking, it's an emotional state where you disconnect from the stress resulting in memories of the extraordinary catastrophic experience. It's kind of, a, the, psychologically, trauma survivors are shattered by the survivor's sense of their invulnerability to harm, you know. Prior to the trauma, many individuals cannot perceive that experience as having happened to them or it happens to somebody else. But when it does happen to them, you know, your entire worldview is, is, is shattered, you know. So that's what happens when people go being traumatized to addiction. Exposure to traumatic events increase the risk of developing a substance use disorder, okay? And this is NIDA's research. And I'm using all government statistics because they're, they're uh, you know, they're something that, you know, they, they're at a level where we can all believe in the, the veracity of them. Um, nearly one in five military service members back from Iraq and Afghanistan have reported symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder or major depression, okay? Recent epidemiological studies suggest that as many as half of all veterans diagnosed with PTSD and also also have co-occurring substance use disorders. Uh, when I started working at the refuge oh, a little over three years ago, um, I, most of the people that I evaluated and assessed and got involved in treatment with were uh, trauma survivors from domestic violence or sexual abuse or or significant accidents or things like that. But uh, over the last, I guess, probably about the last 18 months, I've noticed that there's a lot more military personnel um, coming here for treatment. And uh, to hear their stories is, uh, I mean, I've been doing this for 33 years. I've trained in New York, New Jersey, worked in the Midwest, worked on the West Coast. I have a practice down in Tampa. And uh, the stories that you hear from the clients that come here to the refuge, it's just um, dev it's devastating, especially our military personnel. So if you take a look at these statistics going back to 2010, um, if, you, if one out of every 10 vets have a comorbid PTSD, one in every five come back, you know, with some kind of PTSD, and then half of them have a co-occurring disorder, that translates to a large number of individuals. Between 2003 and 2012, there were 2.5 million Army Navy, Marines, Air Force, Coast Guard, and related reserve personnel that were deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, simple math, math, mathematics tells you then that 25,000 military personnel who served their country and protected us and our loved ones and gave, you know, their life, jeopardized their own life for us came back traumatized and addicted. That's a lot of personnel. It's a lot of people. And thank God that all of the uh, different institutions that are represented here today are all, I'm sure, doing their part to be a part of the solution. But hopefully we can step up. And, and uh, it's very difficult, especially with the military population, the ones that we've treated here. It's, it's, um, I don't want to, um, I don't want to speak uh, uh, poorly about the military culture because I'm not a military person, but it seems to me that sometimes it's not to talk about how much the military experience has adversely impacted you in terms of your trauma experience. So it, it seems to, whether or not the military is, is, uh, is propitiating this culture or the actual victims themselves, it seems to me that many of the military personnel that come back feel a little bit apprehensive to be that self-disclosing about their trauma. All right, what's SAMHSA saying in 2005? Lifetime prevalence of PTSD among adults in the United States is about 8%, okay? Um, 
the rate of PTSD among people with substance use disorders is 12 to 34 percent. Um, now, I'm not a math genius. In fact, uh, truth be told, I failed statistics the first time around. So be that as it may, I think that equates to 50 to 400 percent more people that have substance PTSD and substance abuse than mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a substance abuse population than the general public at large. Okay? So if you are treating substance use individuals and you're not addressing trauma, um, I, it is my opinion or belief that you're missing a large component of the overall clinical presentation. Because anywhere from 12 to 34 percent, based on this research, you know, um, is someone who has a comorbid disorder. SAMHSA 2005. And this other uh, researcher suggested that women with substance abuse problems report a lifetime history of physical or sexual abuse ranging from 55 to 99 percent. Again, anybody working in the um, mental health field, especially in the residential treatment end of the con continuum, where people are at the, the last you know, phase of you know, most restrictive treatment, uh, you're going to find a lot of the patients that are um, sexually abused. And, and one, another thing that I found at the uh, refuge here, even over the last three years that I've been here, is I, I am surprised somewhat a little bit at how many men are coming forward with their own stories of victimization and sexual abuse. Um, and again, I've been in this field for 30 years all over the country, and it, it seems to me like I'm, I'm hearing more stories here about that than I have in the past. Okay, among the clients and substance abuse treatment, okay, PTSD, and this is all from a, a, a different researcher. You know, I'm going to give you some options here to look at in terms of statistical di diversity of the research presented. PTSD is two to three times more common in women than men. Uh, with women with substance abuse disorders, 30 to 59 percent on this researcher, and it's uh, often a common trigger for substance use. Um, it's one of those chicken or egg dilemmas, which came first, the substance use or the trauma, or did the trauma precede the substance use? Um, I guess at the time that we treat people, by the time they get into a residential treatment program, I mean, the important thing is to first identify mm -hmm. if trauma is existent and if, if substance use or, or dependence disorder is existent. And then you can treat them with specific treatment plans designed to remediate each condition, and then hopefully over time figure out which came first. Uh, the trauma or the substance use, whatever the etiology of the symptom presentation for each client, um, I think it's fair to say that anybody who has a substance use disorder and is a trauma survivor has a vulnerability towards um, relapse when the trauma, you know, uh, memories, images become intrusive again because that was the go-to strategy for so many people to self-medicate into oblivion, the impact of the trauma. Um, as a counselor, it's important to recognize and help clients understand that becoming abstinent from substance does not resolve PTSD. Uh, indeed, some PTSD symptoms might become worse with abstinence at first. As clients give up substance use, they may be overwhelmed by a flood of memories and feelings that their substance use had kept at bay. You will feel better once you are clean and sober is not an accurate message to give a client. Unfortunately, um, I think we clinicians, wh whether you're psychiatrist, psychologist, social worker, marriage and family therapist, nurse practitioner, pastoral counselor, licensed mental health counselor, chemical dependency counselor, whatever flavor of professional identity you, you, you endorse and represent, I, it is my belief that we all, in part, get into this field because we want to be a part of the solution to bring about some degree of reconciliation and healing in people's lives and, and be invited into their life to journey from some degree of brokenness to wholeness. So especially when people come in and they present with these overwhelming clinical uh, conditions with, with incredible traumatic stories of, of being victimized, not that, that once isn't enough. I mean, one victimization is plenty, but some of the clients that come here uh, to the refuge have had years of, of abuse and victimization. And you hear that story, and then they, they come in here, and they go through 
go through detox and they, they get their medical stabilization taken care of and then you're working on your 12-step issues and trying to build a foundation for the recovery, it's, I think, a common um, um, occupational hazard, shall I say, for us to want to um, provide some experience, strength, and hope to individuals, which, in fact, I think is important for us to do because m many of the individuals that we see that have these comorbid disorders um, they present with a degree of hopelessness and despair and despondency about, you know, the future to the extent that suicidal ideation and potential becomes a significant factor in the initial um, treatment plan. So we want to instill hope for people where hope doesn't exist. But you have to be realistic. The truth is when a person discontinues their involvement in substance usage, and the cloud starts to lift. And remember we were talking about, you know, one of the psychological effects of trauma is the inability to regulate your emotional stability. Add to that some comorbidity of, say, a bipolar disorder or one of the other more uh, dominant psychiatric mood disorders, and the person is incredibly vulnerable at that point in early stages of recovery to be um, uh, overwhelmed with affect and, and cognitions that don't facilitate their motivation or commitment to continue in their recovery journey. So the last thing you want to do is instill false hope with people. And, and I think it's really important for us to say it hurts now and it may continue to hurt for a while and I don't know how long it's going to hurt for, but it has been my experience that if, if you have the courage, you know, to confront you know, the pain and suffering that you're now overwhelmed with in the safety of, and security of this setting with all of the support systems in place here to help you than uh, I have seen in the past many people in similar situations as you um, come to a place where healing can take place. And I, I think that's fair and reasonable. But uh, again, uh, the, the client will, will not just spontaneously, you know, stop drinking and drugging and say, yes, I was abused and now I'm okay. You know, I mean, it just doesn't happen that way. Everyone on the receiving end of this communication, I'm sure, is aware of that. Okay, let's look at recovery perspective with a uh, substance abusing a codependent uh, a comorbid client. Okay, everyone's aware of the uh, the of stages of change model, okay? And this is kind of a little bit of a somewhat humorous graphic representation of this uh, phenomenon, but it's, it's, not, it's not funny at all to look at the poor person at the end, relapse cycle, start all over. Of, you know, we have to communicate to people that relapse is a part of recovery and that it doesn't always go smoothly. But starting at the beginning part, you know, you have, I think it's important when we, when we treat individuals to develop a treatment plan that is congruent with where they're at, you know, because we may, we may be prone to implement programs and, and, and goals for clients that are beyond their capacity to reach at this point in time. You know, assess and evaluate right up front. Are, are they in the pre-contemplative stage of change, you know? Um, you know, and in AA we would call that denial, and it's kind of like, you know, ignorance is bliss. It's, it's the, uh, you know, ostrich with the head in the kind of effect. You know, if you don't see it, it's not going on. Um, contemplation um, is more of that ambivalence, you know, kind of, sitting on the fence experience where you're not considering change anytime in the near future, okay? But, you know, you're, you may be open to it. When you move over to the preparation stage or the determination stage, um, individuals that are able to get to that level um, generally have some history or some experience with change in the past and they may be testing the waters, you know. Uh, they're planning to act in, 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 a, in a contemplative manner. Uh, it could be, uh, for example, a, a person who's had multiple relapses and, and recovery cycles, and you get the person, and that's why it's important. If you get a person who comes in and this is their third rehab, they understand the 12 steps. They understand what they need to do. They've done what they've needed to do before. They've done the 90 and 90. They've had a sponsor. They've worked the steps. They've been brutally honest, and they've de de derived 
positive results, by experience, strength, and hope, and, and get, living in the promises that come true for them. However, it's a cunning and baffling disease, again, getting back to the disease concept, and relapse is a part of, of the cycle for most of us. So, but anyway, if somebody ha that comes with that perspective may be more easily persuaded to go from preparation to the next step, which is action. And the action is where you just basically have to start practicing the new behaviors. Like I said, going to meetings, talking to other addicts, you know, working the program, reading the literature, doing things that, that bolster your, your own self-efficacy in dealing with the obstacles that are pr present for anyone doing recovery, even more so for those that have the comorbid uh, trauma. But uh, it is not a smooth, you know, trajectory from day one abstinence to whatever, you know, at least post one year to be in sustained remission. Maintenance is, is that. That next step is, you're, you know, you're over the six-month mark, you know, and, and it could go from six months to five years. This is where you're doing follow-up support. You're, re, you're reinforcing the internal rewards. You discuss coping with relapse. And um, uh, I, uh, it was mentioned in my, uh, when Shay uh, talked about my experience, I work in the uh, Florida State uh, with impaired professionals program. I work with impaired physicians and nurses, and, and they are, they're in contract for five years. So it's really a, a, a wonderful thing for me to sit and watch somebody go from day one to five years later and have an incredible metamorphosis and transformative experience before your very eyes over the period of five years. I just uh, discharged one of the nurses from my group last night, and I was like, awesome. You know, there's a person that's had like six DUIs in her life and multiple uh, lost jobs and um, all kinds of, of, as you would imagine, history, numerous uh, um, placements, and she made it through five, didn't just make it through five years. She excelled in the five-year program and manifests, you know, the... Uh, exemplifies a person in recovery. So it's really cool to see people in the maintenance going through it over time. We, those of us who work in residential treatment facilities, may have people longer than most, but you're not going to see in a three-month period or even a four-month period, you know, a person accomplishing those significant goals. I mean, if you can establish some emotional stability and some some, you know, a cognitive restructuring and reframing and, and allow the cloud to lift from the residual uh, effects of the substance use, uh, then you're, and get them committed to an aftercare plan that may be a step down to a partial hospitalization program or an intensive outpatient program, something like that. That is a successful discharge, okay? The last stage here is the relapse. Again, I say somewhat tongue-in-cheek is, you know, kind of the graphic presentation is somewhat humorous, but certainly for anyone who has uh, suffered from this horrific disease and uh, relapse is a part of their, their life story, um, it's anything but, but uh, delightful, you know. Um, but you, what happens is you, re you resume to the old behaviors and you have this kind of fall from grace and uh, then you have, to, you have to get back, pick up the white chip and start all over. <clears throat> okay. Let's take a look at, here's, now we're moving into uh, what I came to the refuge to do over three years ago. Judy Crane brought me to the refuge to work with a, a, a clinical social worker, uh, Andrew uh, Philip Klein, who's uh, actually a clinical director under another facility in the West Coast now. But Andy and I kind of hung out together here in, in the woods, you know, in Apalaha, this national forest, for a couple of years together, trying to develop um, more efficient and effective ways to identify identify what's going on up front with the clients and systematically design treatment plans that we could expeditiously put in place for the rest of the clinical staff to use. Um, Judy was also collecting data for Patrick Carnes and anyway, they needed the MMPI and thank you for the, any of the psychologists at the Karen uh, 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 Foundation that might be listening. Uh, um, they, I, they have been using the MMPI 2RF for a number of years also. Anyway, so as a psychologist, I came in here, started uh, using this MMPI instrument to uh, cross-validate an instrument with, uh, with Dr. Karn's instrument that he was developing for sex addiction. And I went back and I did a kind of a retro retrospective and, uh, uh, account of the clients back in 2012. Now, I, I tested more than 69 clients in 2012, but I just went through my own computer and did a random sample. I looked at... 69 of the clients that I evaluated here at the refuge, okay? 
Of, of the 69 clients that I evaluated at the refuge, only 16 did not have PTSD, okay? 53 were, were diagnosed as having PTSD by other people before they came to me and also validated and supported not only by their MMPI profile, but I, I give an entire battery of tests and spent time, you know, doing clinical interviews with them and, and evaluated the, uh, the literature from the medical records. There was 52 of the 53 people at the refuge in 2012 from my sample had PTSD and a substance use disorder. Now let's get, go back to the stats that we got from uh, SAMHSA and NIDA. The, the original statistics that we looked at in the beginning of this presentation indicated that the general public only has about 8% of the general public over the course of their lifetime experience symptoms consistent with PTSD. Now, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, said that for those people that we treat in the confines of addiction treatment, about 12 to 34% of the people that come in with substance use disorders have a post-traumatic stress disorder. The statistics for this sample, which is pretty sizable, I would say 69 patients, of, of those with, with, sub, with PTSD, of the 53 patients that had PTSD, 52 had a substance use disorder. That's calculated to 98% that are manifesting comorbid diagnoses of the substance use disorder and trauma disorder here at the refuge. Now, again, I, I, I want to speak uh, to say that I respect uh, a number of people, a number of, or everyone, everyone who's listening, if you're a colleague and just by the very fact that you're interested in this and you want to learn more, I respect the fact that you're here and thank you for being a part of this uh, presentation. Having said that, I also respect that there are probably a number of people out there that have at least my amount of experience, if not more, and different specializations like physicians and psychiatrists and social workers who have worked in the trenches, and my goodness, in, in Department of Child and Family Services with terribly, you know, traumatized children and stuff. I'm sure that a lot of you who are listening have had your own experience in different systems. But I, I was trained in New York, New Jersey. I've worked in the Midwest. I've worked on the West Coast. I've been in practice and down in the Tampa Bay area for about um, 15 years now. I've been working with impaired physicians and nurses around the state for the last decade. I literally have, have worked with thousands and thousands of people throughout my career, and I've never seen a group as traumatized as the group of people that I have had the privilege and honor to meet and work with here at the refuge over the last three years. And I had these discussions with, with uh, Judy right up front when I started doing this testing. I was like, uh, I, I, I'm not getting a commission on labeling somebody as, a, as PTSD or substance use disorder. And, and you know, my, my integrity is not for sale. So I'm only giving people labels diagnostically that I believe clinically are legitimate, justifiable, and are representations of what's going on for them at that time. I've never seen so many people with, with this comorbid disorder in one place at one time. And so I said to Judy, you know, actually these MMPIs that I'm doing, um, a lot of people are actually kind of looking psychotic, you know, and for those psychologists who are listening, you know, that you're thinking, well, the F scales are high or whatever, the validity scales are a little bit askewed, and, and that's why they look psychotic. But, you know, I think there's other explanations for why people who are traumatized, and we're, we're just looking at affect and cognition, but in terms of thought disorder, people that respond to the MMPI, uh, and this was Andy Klein's idea, uh, you know, if you do an MMPI assessment, you take the, the actual assessment and you look at the overall, uh, you know, analysis of scores in any given uh, clinical um, scale, whether they're depressed or thought disordered or anxious, and then you make a judgment as to whether or not they meet the criteria for that for that um, particular disorder. But Andy started looking at the printouts, and he's like, gee, Tom, you know, you've got this whole critical item section, you know, because a number of the clients I really couldn't interpret because they're their validity scales were distorted, you know, and I said, well, I really can't make a definitive diagnosis, but let's go in and look at these I statements, and, and you, you're able to use the I statements as ways of developing a treatment plan for individuals, and some of the individuals that come in here will, you know, they'll score high on deviant thinking and experience. They'll say things like, I've had peculiar and strange experiences, true, 
Uh, peculiar odors come to me at times. True. Aberrant experiences. I've had, uh, I've never seen a vision. False. Um, I, you know, I often feel as if things are not real. True. I have strange and peculiar thoughts. True. I sometimes seem to hear my thoughts being spoken out loud. True. All of these kinds of statements that are, that are embedded in the MMPI scales um, are trigger like thought disorder type symptoms. But you have to think of the population. Look beyond the actual instrument. I mean, a lot of the patients that I was treating here early on were kind of like uh, young, the upper socioeconomic strata, 20-somethings who, who have logged a lot of time in the raves, done a lot of ecstasy. Some people coming off of, you know, a couple week long you know, uh, 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 events of shooting up pharmaceutical methadrine and speed. And you, you know that when people do that, they're going to get paranoid. They're going to have uh, aberrant experiences. So sometimes the aberrant experiences that the people are manifesting or, or expressing, especially in the residential, the residential end of the continuum, are related to their, um, their drug usage, not necessarily their psychopathology, okay? So I learned to be a little bit more liberal in that regard and not throw thought disorder diagnoses at people, especially with respect to this population, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a case study. I'm going to give you a, a, a client, uh, of course, protect her confidentiality. This is a real client uh, who uh, I met with uh, a couple of years ago because um, at the time I was using the MMPI, uh, I don't know if I used the MMPI 2RF. Yes, it was a 2RF that I used on her. But anyway, here's the client that I, I met with. She was a 21-year-old Caucasian female who was heavily tattooed. Okay, I don't know if that's you know, that aberrant in itself like today, but I'm just making comments of what she looked like. She was a bit hyperactive. Her speech was rapid and pressured. Uh, mood was euthymic, affect full and range. She denied any thought dis disorder symptoms and none were observed to me. Again, this is interesting because uh, um, her actual MMPI, I just read to you the statements from her MMPI. She endorsed those statements. So her thought disorder scales were elevated, but, you know, it was more related to her substance usage than a thought disorder. So she denied them at the time that we, we met for our clinical interview. Processes were loose and tangential. Attention and concentration were impaired. Memory was intact, basically. She denied any suicidal or homicidal ideation, okay? So again, this is, the, this is pretty much a normal client for here uh, in terms of her presentation. Uh, what was the background information? What brought her here? Let's take a look at the substance use first. You know, she was an abuser of methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin, cannabis, and alcohol. Okay, again, not a, a unusual. You know, um, client here. A number of clients here have a, a, a preference for perhaps opiates or uh, or cocaine or or meth, but a lot of them have extensive cross-addictive histories. Onset of alcohol and cannabis use at age 15, all other drugs at age 16, okay? Uh, no treatment effect from uh, uh, prior outpatient treatment. Inpatient rehab 19 for three weeks. Uh, she discharged AMA, okay? So that's the, she's had some extensive history in the past with respect to not only usage, but therapeutic intervention, and it's still not having a treatment effect. What's her trauma background? This young lady came with uh, reported chronic physical abuse by a boyfriend that she had in a two-year relationship. That was enough uh, to warrant, you know, the diagnosis of PTSD when, when I got into the actual history itself. This is the next point that I want you to pay close attention to. She denied any sexual abuse to me, okay, but she admitted to having 15 sexual partners between the ages of 16 to 21, and all were adult men even when she was 16. Okay, now I don't know what states you're, you're, you're coming, hailing from. A number of you are coming from different states, and each state is different, but the 16-year-old whose first boyfriend is 25, you know, she's not, at, at the time that she's meeting me at the intake, at the earlier stages, she's not perceiving any of this as being abusive or, or being, you know, aberrant, you know, when in fact, you know, uh, I don't think I have to, you know, sell anyone listening on this, that that is something that needed to be addressed in the context of her uh, clinical uh, relationship with her therapist, and it was. At some point before she got discharged, she did realize that that was victimization, and uh, she 
was subjected to many uh, different situations where perpetrators, uh, you know, impacted her, her um, trauma and exacerbated it and made it worse. Okay, so this is uh, the, uh, the diagnostic impression. This is before I started using the, the DSM-5. I'm switched over now, but this, this was a couple years ago and I wasn't on to the 5 yet. So this is what I diagnosed her with, based on uh, not just the MMPI profile, but on my clinical background and, and you know, because I didn't even mention anorexia nervosa here in our presentation because it wasn't necessarily relevant, but I want you to know, uh, outside the context of this presentation, she had bipolar disorder and an eating disorder and a lot of other stuff going on, okay? Um, and that's what I, I wrapped it up with in terms of my five-axis diagnosis. Now, I'm sure there's going to probably be some of you out there thinking, eh, why is access two? Why is there nothing on access two? Um, I kind of had a sense with this person that there was, at a minimum, uh, some borderline characteristics or traits. Uh, but you know, uh, because of the, mm, I don't, the, because of the validity problems with respect to the MMPI. And because she had so many other things going on, I was like, let it go, you know, and that's just my call, you know. Um, it, you know, certainly the underlying character pathology will come out in the context of her treatment here uh, and, and certainly in the, in the aftercare part of the uh, uh, treatment when she gets medically stable and gets, does some good trauma work, you can address some of the, you know, residual character defects that are also contributing to her propitiating her addiction, you know, that are residual from the trauma. But at this point, I, I didn't feel the need to do that. So, so that's, that's what I have with this client. Now let's take a look at how she responded to the MMPI items. And now I use the MMPI as I statements. Again, AKA Andy Klein, thank you very much. She was like, we can take these I statements right out of the content of the MMPI and put them in the treatment plan and said she did this or she said this and we go back over them as a therapist and say this is what you said is that where you're at yes okay this is what you said no I didn't really mean it that way and you can take a look at the depression and worry scales in the MMPI they have different uh, scales that are that are impacted by the statements most of the time I feel blue she said true I usually feel that life's worthwhile false I, at times I think I'm no good at all true can see these items. Again, the cr critical items with respect to suicidal ideation and potential. She's endorsing all of these, okay? So that's, you know, important when it comes to taking a look at the treatment plan. Uh, one other uh, side note in terms of the MMPI-2 RF. I like the RF better than the old 2 because, and I use the 2, I learned, I went to school so long ago I learned on the MMPI-1, but in 89, the 2 came out, it's 567 questions. The, the RF is th uh, 338 questions derived from the 567. Some new uh, uh, scales in the sci-fi scales are from there, the restructured form scales. So I just kind of like it. It's, 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 uh, it's easier for the client and it gives you more information. Uh, acute anxiety state. Let's take a look at some of these statements. Imagine if you had this data when a client comes in and they fill out this, 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 this assessment form and you take a look at this protocol, whether or not you're a psychologist, regardless of whether or not you have the experience or ability to make an interpretive inference based on the clinical profile, you can take a look at the critical item statements in the back of the report and make a, develop a treatment plan based out of this. So here you have anxiety. These are all anxiety state statements. Here you want to take a look at maybe implement, implementing treatment plans that include somatic experience interventions or, or mindfulness or breath work, you know, for the anxiety person, okay? Um, here there's another thing she endorsed were all about sleep disturbance. Now, it would be rather easy to argue that these nightmares and fitful and disturbed sleep patterns are the result of some of the PTSD trauma that uh, she's dealing with while she's here. Um, this is where I think she went to the uh, medical department here. They gave her some melatonin some, uh, 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 and did some other interventions with her psychiatrically and uh, addressed these problems appropriately so that she had that uh, component also as a part of her resources for recovery. So what you have here is just an example of one client. We addressed depression, anxiety, sleep disturbance. There's a lot of other comorbid things that are going on for clients that don't reach the DSM-4 or TR or 5 criteria. And this is what Andy and I came up with, uh, unaddressed co-occurring issues that limit the effectiveness of alcohol or drug treatment. 
here at the Refuge, we have a number of clients that have adoption-related issues. We, I didn't even really talk about attachment here in the context of this presentation, but, but, it, but attachment-related problems are pervasive in the population that we treat here, and they don't have to necessarily be adopted uh, uh, clients to have difficulty with uh, having healthy uh, attachment issues. Um, the uh, eating disorders, dependent traits, financial problems, impulsivity, a lot of the, uh, I think we have gambling in here somewhere, a lot of the uh, clients also uh, have uh, a number of process addictions and of course the, um, the refuge is notorious for treating people with uh, chronic, um, not only sexual victimization but sexual disorders and so uh, uh, perpetrators also, um, sex, sex addicts as Carnes would say. I'm going to take some slides now right out of uh, Judy Crane's uh, nuts and bolts presentation. If you've seen her presentation, these come right out of the presentation. This is, uh, we do some art therapy here at the Refuge, and, and this is a real, a real drawing written by one of our real clients. And if you take the time to look at all the things that she's putting on, on the arms, you know, uh, cutting, you know, and you can read them. And some of them are, are, are um, uh, pretty, how would I say, profane. <laughs> for lack of a better term, some of the things that, sh that she's saying here are rather profane, but this is her experience. This is her experience and her cutting, and so many of the individuals that come here are so traumatized that, it's, that for some reason they decide that it's, it's easier to deal with physical pain than psychological pain as a result of the trauma, and they have excessive cutting, okay? Um, sick, you know, it, I deserve it. You know, maintain it, die. I love pain. You know, um, don't speak. You know, these are these are messages, cognitive messages that she's given to herself over time. There's another one with a broken heart, a bleeding broken heart. Some of these individuals are so incredibly creative, and and the pictures that they draw capture the essence of their trauma. Here's another one that used a, a collage type of uh, heart. You know. Roller coaster of grief, shadow of sorrow, angry at God. Okay, the spiritual. How do you get somebody to wrap themselves around the first three steps when they're angry at God because of the victimization they suffered as a child? You can't make sense of, of how a child gets so traumatized through victimization, but yet you can certainly understand his or her anger at God. So how are you going to even initiate a foundation for recovery until that person is able to address these trauma issues? What if we're coming up on uh, almost a, I have three more minutes before we open up for questions. Uh, so I just want to kind of wrap up and say, what did we, what did we address? Um, hmm. I think the thing that I wanted to let you know, this is a picture. This is actually a picture of the refuge. There, there's like, I don't know, now I think they have 80 acres, but they use 40 acres in the Okalawaha National Forest, and it's just spectacularly gorgeous. Uh, I think our secret weapon here is, is God's creation, you know, because there's a lot of healing on this land. Uh, this is another picture of the, uh, just the, you know, experiencing the beauty and wonderment of this area. Uh, I used to sleep here at night uh, when I put in a couple days a week here, and, and uh, I would go out late at night, and the night, would, the night sky would just explode with stars. There's something, there's something powerfully healing about this place, and I found out from one of the staff here, a, a young man who does uh, a lot of drug testing here, I, he told me one day it's, he actually grew up on this property. His grandfather owned it at one time uh, before it was sold out to the YMCA and then before Judy took it over and before it, is, it evolved to where it is today. And he said, you know, I remember growing up and playing on these grounds and being told that the seminal Native American tribe used to consider this holy land. And it, and it just so made sense to me because as soon as you drive onto this property, if you're intuitive or spiritually aware in any shape, manner, or form, it, there's just this overwhelming sense of peace and harmony and tranquility in the air until you go into a room in a group setting or an individual session and there's a yin and a yang going on. There's all this wonderful beauty of God's creation in this environment, in this sector, this vortex, whatever, but the, the amount of pain and suffering that comes here, remember 52 out of 53 subjects, substance use disorder and trauma, is palpable. It's, I mean, I've, I've shed more than one tear in this, on this property with clients. So what did we cover? Basically, it's a primary disease, uh, chronic disease, the brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. Um, 
We also have a lot of comorbidity that goes on, okay, um, that has to be addressed in that context. And, uh, and I think what we have is uh, a lot of opportunity to touch people's lives. What we found here at the clients at the uh, refuge is um, most clients at the refuge present with profoundly capacitating problems associated with affective instability and cognitive impairment. And I'm not, I don't know, maybe there, maybe there are other people listening to my presentation and saying, yeah, our facility treats people like this. We have the same population. And, and uh, I, would, I would argue the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are too few. And I hate to use that analogy because it's not that I want to see more people that are traumatized. I don't know what bothers me more, the amount of people that are traumatized or the amount of perpetrators out there that have inflicted, that have inflicted trauma on, on individuals. Be that the case, I'm grateful to be a part of uh, the refuge system here and a part of the solution for a number of people's lives. And that's about all I got. So thank you. And I will field a couple of questions now. Um, a question from Jonathan. Uh, on the a ASAM slide, the presenter talked about being overwhelmed by adaptations. Could you explain that more uh, when it's time for questions? <laughs> <laughs> this is the time. Um, okay, I think, I think what's happening is when, it, when a person has trauma, as I said, trauma diminishes a person's capacity to function efficiently and effectively from a Darwinian evolutionary perspective. When you add uh, the impaired judgment and impulsivity and impulse control problems that are associated with addiction to that, I think that it's the person becomes um, kind of like, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, I don't know if you ever saw, if you're in undergraduate study, we had rats in a Skinner box, and you, 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 you shop the bottom of the grid, no matter what they do, whether they go near the, near the bar or not, and you instill, learn helplessness in them, and the poor little guys just sit there and defecate and urinate, and they don't know what to do. They're incapacitated. They no longer have the ability to adapt to the situation because they have learned helplessness and they're out of control. So maybe, maybe that's, I think, and maybe that's what they're trying to make reference to, is the two combined, the gestalt, trauma and addiction, overwhelm a person and incapacitate their ability to be adapting to new situations. What, what wouldn't be necessarily... Uh, um, would, wouldn't push you or me, if we're not trauma survivors, what wouldn't, quote, push us over the edge into a panic disorder, you know, just a, a uh, car backfiring, boom, you know, going by. Uh, one of the veterans here one night, I just saw, just in a, in a dining room, just somebody dropped a plate or something, and he, bam, just slammed, hit the floor. I mean, he just went under the table just spontaneously. And, it, oh, my God, it that's so sad to see, you know, but that's, everyone else just kept eating, and, he, and these are even in a group of people that have been traumatized, but his trauma was military related, and so he had zero capacity to cope with the loud noise of a plate dropping and, and, and breaking. Tom, you, uh, this is a question from Tom. Uh, you mentioned PH and IOP for post-discharge residential clients. Does that work given that these programs are dominated by people on, on pre-contemplation? Um, wow, that's a, actually a fair question. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, mean, I, I don't have any uh, research. After, I don't have research to suggest that I'm in the know of what happens to all the PHP, IOP clients two years down the road. I suspect that given the amount of trauma that they bring to the table, uh, that they are even at, after having a, a positive residential placement, after having a positive transition to po po partial hospitalization, the intensive outpatient program, I suspect they're still more vulnerable than most to relapse, okay? Um, um, but as we now, we, we've divided relapse into lapse and relapse. What happens? Does a person, you know, go back to their drug of choice and then within a few days go, oh, my God, I've got to call my sponsor, get back on the steps and get back into be honest and be brutally honest and work my program and work my therapist? Um, I'd like to think that whatever the outcome, for me personally, I don't, if anyone here on the receiving end is working, and Tom, if you're working in a residential treatment facility, my belief and bias is whoever is working in a residential treatment facility, the most, um, uh, what would be the, I think the most valid um, discharge plan should include 
some continuum of care, you know, partial hospitalization or intensive outpatient program, especially now if you're dependent on third-party reimbursement, and we're limited here even by that, like now at the, at the refuge where, where they have a pretty, pretty solid 90-day program designed for clients, some clients only have 30 days um, insurance reimbursement. And so uh, the bad news is they don't have enough resources to go the full distance. The good news is, is that now that, you know, Acadia has brought all of their resources to bear, uh, we have a lot more opportunity to reach a lot more people. The, the, the population here is not just the up and outers, the socioeconomic uh, strata at the upper end of the continuum. You can have a blue collar worker um, person here who just has some enough insurance to cover them for the uh, for this much of a length of stay. So I think that uh, we have to we have to put them in the most continuum, uh, put them in the least, least intrusive uh, level of intervention that makes sense to them. So I don't know. I, Got kind of cir circular in that and answer. Do I do I use me personally? I do not use DBT, but we have DBT therapists here uh, on in in the program here. We have DBT trained therapists, and and the research uh, is is pretty vast and extensive out there, suggesting that it has value in the in the greater scheme of things. My what I bring to the table, I think my if I was on a football. I'd be a field goal keeper. I mean, I do good assessments. I, I, I do a very good job taking a look at a person, evaluating them, assessing them, saying what I think is going on, and then handing it off to the treatment team. But we do have DBD th therapists here, and they apparently get very good results as a part of the treatment plan. All right, Kevin, uh, what is this, uh, a COD? I'm sorry. <coughs> Uh, uh, co I don't know if it was comorbid diagnosis where they have, uh, I'd have to look at the slide, whether it make a reference to um, a recovery perspective with a uh, um, COD client. These are clients that have um, chemical dependency, chemical or drug dependency. I, I have to go back to the actual uh, uh, citation, but I think the COD stood for chemical or drug client or codependent uh, co comorbid treatment. Uh, Marissa, how do you help a client control generalizations from a traumatic event in terms of treatment? Wow. Mm. Man, I wish I had an answer to that. I'm not going to try and fake it. I, I, you know what, Marissa? Um, I don't know. Is, that is really a, a very, very solid and valid clinical you know, question. Um, how do we prevent them from generalizing um, their traumatic experience in other ways. And I mean, that's, mm -hmm. um, that's where we have to look at relapse prevention strategies, not just for uh, their drug of choice, but for um, gambling, for sex addiction, for, 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 for food, for shopping, some of the other more process addictions that might, it's kind of like, um, I don't want to make light of this, but you, know, you go to the carnival, that whack-a-mole thing, you hit one mole and another mole pops up, you hit another mole and another pole, mole pops up. It's kind of like, whack-a-mole sometimes because at each client, you know, they, they come with their own history and their own vulnerabilities. I might be vulnerable to cross-addicting to food, whereas the next person might be vulnerable to cross-addicting to gambling. So I don't really know the answer to your question other than to use a, a, a treatment team, staff them, you know, get ideas. Uh, these complicated presenting cases require complicated, you know, interventions and comprehensive interventions. And sometimes it takes a village to raise a child. Sometimes it takes an entire treatment team. I, in my private practice on an outpatient basis, um, you know, I couldn't even begin. I, I refer people to residential care regularly when I know that I'm way over my head, even with my clinical experience and background. I mean, I'm not, nobody can be that good, myself included. So, you know, I'm a big proponent of, you know, the longer you can keep a person in, in treatment and give them good treatment, the better foundation you can build. So that would be my, I guess my answer would be try to keep them in treatment as long as possible. And if you can't keep them at the residential level of care, try and get them in partial hospitalization or IOP. Keep them engaged in treatment and also work a 12-step program of recovery as an adjunct to the, to the professional treatment they're getting. That's it for the questions. I think we're out of time. And... Um, yeah, I'll, I'll turn this over to Shay, but thank you very much for letting me be a part of your day. Okay, guys, I hope everyone enjoyed the webinar today. Uh, please feel free to email me with any questions that you may have that you think of later uh, for Dr. Antonek. Just to do a little housekeeping, all of the continuing education forms and the PowerPoint are available on our website. They are on the About Us 
uh, portion of the website under events. And if you'll just click the same place you went to register for the webinar, uh, about halfway down the page, uh, there will be three links. One is going to be for your sign-in sheet, one will be for the evaluation of the presentation, and the other uh, will be Dr. Antonek's uh, PowerPoint. I look forward to reading you all's evaluation and having you join us next time. I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thanks, thanks guys.